Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. And I want to say welcome to everybody who's watching from Grace Bible Chapel in Hillview and from other parts of the world today as we uh, continue in our study of the book of John. And today we're going to be uh, verses 19 through 39 of chapter 1. And uh, I'd like to just go ahead and pray one more time. Lord, I want to say thank you so much for everything you've given us. You are amazing. And one of the things I'm very grateful for, Lord, is that this faith that you ask us to have is not just a blind faith, a leap in the dark, but that it's rooted in history and in fact and in many other things. And today, as we take a look at what you have written for us here, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to pierce the veil sometimes that our own hearts put in front of things and let us see the cold hard facts and the truth of who you really are. We thank you for all this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> Figuring things out can be a lot of work. I don't know what process you go through in trying to figure something out, but I go through like, who do I trust to make my decision? What are the facts? What are the motives of those involved? Do they have your benefit in mind or do they even agree with me on what I think is good and what I'm trying to accomplish? So let's take something simple, for example. Let's say you've moved into a new area and you're trying to figure things out and you want to find out, well, how can I find a good plumber? Or maybe a financial consultant or maybe a dentist, or maybe just a repairman. How do you go about figuring all those things out? Well, what do you try to do? You try to get a recommendation from somebody. That's also called a testimony. Somebody who will give you feedback on their own personal experience with somebody you can trust. So uh, let's make this a little more difficult now. Let's say that you're trying to figure out something like is there truth? Is there someone who represents truth? Is there a God? It's the same concept as trying to find a repairman. It's just a lot more daunting and potentially much, much more important. So it's important to have somebody that you can trust somebody that can give you that recommendation. It's helpful to have somebody who has understanding to give you a clue. And that's where we're coming in today with a testimony that will help us determine that. And we want to look at the testimony of a man named John the Baptist. And so that brings us to our passage. And let's read this together here. Verse 19 of chapter 1, it says, This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So when you think of a testimony, what is it that you actually think of? Um, a lot of us probably think of a church testimony. Maybe somebody getting up and getting baptized and where they tell of their experience of coming to faith. And that is actually something along the lines of what we're looking at here, but is based in something much older than that. And that's where people gave testimonies in terms of searching for the truth. So think of a courtroom testimony as popularized on TV, where you might raise your right hand and you say, repeat after me, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Let's hold my hand together like that. What are you supposed to be doing at that time? Well, you're supposed to be relating everything that you saw, what happened, until it, with no additions, no subtractions, just tell it the way it is. So that people can make a decision based upon the facts of you being an eyewitness. Now, in our culture, it's become a little fashionable to think of testimonies as weak. 
but in reality, they are crucial for determining what happened in the past. Um, and without them, you really can't tell. So I asked somebody for their definition of a testimony or the importance of a testimony. And this is, as I anonymously put, by a lawyer in our midst. I make a joke. Lawyers don't like to write anything down, so keep this anonymous. It says, in the law, eyewitness testimony can be the most persuasive and compelling form of evidence available to establish the truth of what happened due to the eyewitness's direct perception through their five senses of the events in question. And so in the courtroom even today, the eyewitness testimony is the most important thing to be able to determine whether something happened. And in the Bible, it's at least that important. Over and over again, you're going to see written in the Bible where it says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every fact be established. And that's repeated from Genesis, or at least in the Pentateuch, all the way through to the end of the Bible. In the mouth of two or three witnesses. And so today we're coming to this section in John where testimony is really, really important. The word testimony itself is used over 30, or testify is used over 33 times, and being a witness or testifier is used 14 times. And the whole thing of assertion of truth is used over 38 times as you go into the scripture here. I'm saying just in the book of John. And so remember that the book of John is being written so that you and I can have enough facts so that we can believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that in believing, we can live. And so, unlike, again, the popular, I would have to say, myth, that you have to take a blind leaf of faith, the book of John is actually doing the exact opposite right here. The book of John is saying, I want to give you the facts. I want to give you enough facts that you can make a reasonable choice for Jesus Christ. And so the importance of the testimony is very, very important. Why? Because you don't want to be deceived. I know I don't want to be deceived. And in this world, we find that there are a lot of people who are trying to give us a sell job or trying to deceive us. Even in Proverbs, it says, many a man proclaims his own faithfulness but who can find a trustworthy friend? You know, there are three words that are synonymous, trust, faith, and believe. And in fact, in the New Testament, all of those are translation of the same Greek word. We want to find something that is trustworthy. We want to find someone who is faithful. We want to find something that is credible. And that's what a testimony is supposed to be. It's supposed to give you and I a credible basis for moving forward. And this is the testimony of John the Baptist. So who is John the Baptist? Well, first of all, let's take a look at who he is not. Okay, in verses 20 through 21, and he confessed, and that means he simply agreed, and he did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ, and they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. And are you the prophet? And he answered, no. I almost feel like this is a game of 20 questions, okay? Like the person has gotten, a, they're just trying to guess. Okay, are you the Messiah? Okay, then are you Elijah? And they're guessing, and John is answering their questions. But I want to step back for a second here as we take a look at this. I think oftentimes we sort of have this feeling about John the Baptist, that he was sort of like one of these guys that went around walking with a signboard that said, repent, the end is near, and just sort of came down in the streets without any context or anything like that. First of all, he didn't come down into the streets. He was out in the wilderness. And he came down in the context of several thousand years of history with some prophecies and other things that were directly... Um, coming to bear on that time right there in Israel. 
And so I want to go back to something that we were looking at about two years ago when we were going through the book of Daniel. Daniel, as a young man, went into captivity, was taken to Babylon, and there, as he was being trained up to be one of the advisors to the king, one of the wise men, um, the king had a vision, and in that vision he saw a statue, a statue made up of four different metals, and he, Daniel was called in to interpret the dream. And in that dream, okay, Daniel gave us a map of time. He gave us a map of future kingdoms. And I don't have time to go into this in great detail today. I'm just doing this hopefully to remind those of you who were there and to encourage those of you who weren't to go back and actually go through the series that we had back in Daniel, back starting in around October 2018. That we started off with the kingdom of Babylon, and then that moved into the kingdom of Persia, which is the silver there. And then we moved into the kingdom of Alexander the Great and the Greeks and the Seleucid and all the Ptolemaic uh, empires that were going on. And then we moved into the Roman Empire. And during this period of time, Daniel had more visions. And one of the things that he saw as he was talking culminated in Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it talks about a period of time that was going to come about. And that came out to about 483 years. And he said, after that period of time, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. So approximately five to six hundred years prior to this point, Daniel was talking about the Messiah. And so Daniel is there at the top of the statue and he predicts that somewhere about this time the Messiah is coming. Now Israel knows the Messiah is coming. This is not just something that has just come out of the blue. Okay? We're going to see more about this in just a second. And so into this environment into this thought process, frankly, into this area of rising expectation, John comes right before the Messiah and starts saying, get ready, the Lord is coming. There are um, writings called Targums, and I've been having some Uh, talks with uh, Mike uh, Tisdell, and he's been helping me understand some of this. And the Targums were Jewish writings that actually were, we have manuscript evidence for, that were the first century before Jesus came. Many of us are aware of the Mishnah and the Talmud, and these are things that came about in writings probably a little bit later on. But I think it's very important to see that here, okay, according to the Jewish scripture, which we would call the Old Testament, this is what was written in these texts at the time that John the Baptist was there. Said the prophet said to the house of David, and he's quoting from Isaiah, and maybe I should step back for a second. The Targums were a little bit like an amplified Bible to a commentary. So they were talking about the biblical text, but they were giving commentary on it. And so this is from one of those manuscripts. And it says, the prophet said to the house of David that a boy has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and he has received the Torah upon himself to keep it. And his name has been called from before the one who causes wonderful counsel, God the warrior, the eternally existing one, the Messiah who will increase in peace upon us in his days. Much is the greatness for the doers of the Torah. 
and there is no end to those who keep peace upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to build it in justice and in merit from now and forever. This will be done by the memra of the Lord of hosts. This was in the mindset of the people there. And I, I want to make one special note. That last line that says, this will be done by the memra of the Lord of hosts. The word memra there is actually Aramaic. And it's Aramaic for the word. And this will be done by the word of the Lord of hosts. Okay, this is not just talking about his voice, but they're characterizing the Messiah as the word. And hopefully that's ringing a few bells from last week and the week before, where in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so John the Baptist comes into this expectation where people like Simeon is in the temple waiting for the Messiah, and Anna is in the temple waiting for the Messiah. And the Essenes and others have gone off waiting for the Messiah because the clock is ticking and they know that the bell is about ready to go off and the Messiah, according to the prophecy of Daniel and others, is about ready to ring. And so these men were sent out by the leaders back in Jerusalem And they said, so are you claiming to be the Messiah? And John said, no. And they say, so what then? Do you claim to be Elijah? So who's Elijah? Well, most of us know that Elijah was a prophet from the Old Testament who fought the prophets of Baal, um, called down fire from heaven, was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. You know, all the stuff that little boys' dreams are made of. You can sort of visualize all this. And they said, so are you him? Well, why, why are they asking about Elijah? Well, because of this verse in Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. It says, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And Jesus confirms this. He says in Matthew 17, and he answered and said, Elijah is coming and he will restore all things. Some of you will recall from Revelation um, chapter 11, verse 3, where it talks about two witnesses that are going to be at Jerusalem and uh, for three and a half years will be witnessing there. There are many of us who believe that Elijah will probably be one of those witnesses. The scripture doesn't say, but it does seem to make sense. So even today, if you go to a Passover, a Seder, they will set a chair aside for Elijah. And it's an empty chair. And before they participate in the Passover, they will send somebody to the door, and you will open the door, and they'll look out and they say, has Elijah come? And when the answer comes back, no, they say, okay, then we can celebrate the Passover one more time. And so it's part of the mindset, and it was even part of the mindset back then in a lot of these rituals and other things that had been going on for a period of time. And they asked John, they said, John, are you Elijah? And John said, no, I'm not. So they said, well, are you the prophet? And he said, well, why are they asking about the prophet? This goes back to Deuteronomy When Moses was speaking, Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. And so they didn't know who this prophet was going to be, but they knew he was coming. And they didn't realize that he and the Messiah were the same. And so they asked John, Are you this prophet? And John said, No. So, Who was John? And then they said to him, Well, who are you then? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, 
as Isaiah the prophet has said. So the men who had come to him quit guessing, and they finally said, okay, we need to answer the guys that sent us, so would you please tell us who you are? And if I was John the Baptist, I probably would have said, I thought you would never ask. And he said this. He said, I am a voice of one crying into the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. He's saying, what am I doing? I am the person that says, let's make straight the path of the Lord today. To get the best picture of what might be going through people's head at this point in time would be what we might think of as the go-ahead team for the president. Okay, if the president is going someplace, the president of the United States, he will send a go-ahead team. Okay, and that go-ahead team does many things. First of all, they're going to make sure that the place is secure. They're going to make sure that they have accommodations. They're going to be working through the various things that have to happen with the authorities in the spot there. They're going to be arranging the itinerary, making sure that everything is set up. This is all part of the go-ahead team, the prep team that we might say for something happening. Well, in the ancient world, there was something like that as well, where people would go ahead and make straight the path for the king that was coming, make sure the roads were in the right conditions and make everything um, ready for his travel there. But the path that John the Baptist is trying to make straight is a little bit different. This is not just a physical path that he's trying to make different. This is a path that goes right through yours and my heart. And he is saying, I am trying to get you to have your heart in the right condition so that when the Messiah comes, you will be ready to receive him. And there is a lot in our hearts that are crooked, and there are a lot in our hearts that cause us not to see straight. But we'll deal with that a little bit later in this message. What I want to talk about now just for a second is what are the qualifications of a witness, one giving a testimony. And there are qualifications of a good witness, and again, this is from the lawyer in our midst. He said, a good witness must be credible, no reputation for lying or history of providing false testimony. He has to be consistent in their account every time they provide their testimony, and ideally, their testimony can be corroborated. And like we said in the scripture, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be confirmed, um, you'll find that the whole book of John is a series of testimonies and witnesses to the very fact that Jesus is who he claims to be. Now, there's another type of witness, and that is the qualifications of an expert witness being brought in, and some of us in the chapel here actually are called on stage uh, at the courtroom to be an expert witness. And I don't have time to go through all these, but if you have time um, and you want to go back and take a look at this slide, if you're looking online, you can look at it. But one of the things that you look for is specialized knowledge in an individual witness. And this is right from the federal rules of evidence. Well, what I want to talk about here is that John fit both of these categories. He was a good witness because he had actually experienced certain things and he was testifying to what he had seen. And we're going to see this in this next section of verses. And also, he was an expert witness. In other words, there was a special knowledge that he'd been given as the prep team to know when the Messiah was coming. And I'd like to just suggest that, you know, if the prep team, the go-ahead team, who's setting up things for the president says, the president is here, get ready, I would expect you to jump and understand exactly what was happening at that point in time. You would take them seriously. John, as the go-ahead team for the Messiah, said, the Messiah is here. He's in your midst. Pay attention. So let's go ahead and read these verses. Next section of verses 24 through 28, he says, Now then, oh, excuse me, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, 
Why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Why was John baptizing them? John was baptizing them as part of his job. They were asking him, why were you doing this? And his first answer is sort of interesting. He says, you're really getting the minutia in front of the big picture. He says, I am baptizing but the one you are looking for is in your midst right now. And if you're really concerned about this, you should be concerned about him, and you shouldn't be concerned about me. And I'd like to just sort of step aside here for a second and say that oftentimes the answer is right before us, and we're so consumed with the little details that we haven't looked up and seen the big picture right in front. The biggest is who Jesus is. And that's who John the Baptist was pointing to. So why was he baptizing them? He was trying to get their hearts ready for the Messiah. He was there to point them out. So what did John testify when he saw Jesus? It says, the next day he saw Jesus come to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. You know, it's the very next day after he's been talking to these people who've been sent from the priests and the Levites that Jesus actually walks, in a sense, out of the mists of time and into the public daylight as the announced one, the anointed one, the Messiah. And John looks at him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. There was a consciousness among many in Israel that the Messiah was not just going to be some conquering hero. That the Messiah was also going to have to be a sacrifice. And like we read in Daniel, that he was going to have to be cut off. You know, our breaking of bread this morning, somebody actually referred to these verses. But I want you to think about them. Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And the next verse says, he, that is Jesus, or the Messiah, was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. The Lamb of God. Hundreds of years before he stepped out onto the pages of history, And John pointed the finger and said, Behold, Isaiah was talking about him. A few hundred years after Isaiah, Daniel is talking about him. And throughout the whole scope of the Old Testament, every sacrifice and every 
pint of blood that was spilled on those altars was a type of Jesus who was coming. We just spent a whole series in the book of Leviticus about all the different sacrifices, and every one of those sacrifices pointed to Jesus as our Messiah, the Lamb of God. (coughs) It actually causes me to tremble to be in John's spot then and to see him manifested walking out of the pages of history and knowing what was going to happen. And knowing that every verse that had been written up to that time was being fulfilled in their midst. There are many out there, I hope, who are listening today who personally don't know Jesus as your lamb, as your sacrifice. And I want you to think for a moment Where do you stand? Do you need a Savior? I know I do. When I was writing this, uh, words of a song came to my head. We sing it oftentimes. And I actually started tearing up when I was thinking about it then, too. Said, O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Well, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb. John's testimony is that the Messiah, the Lamb of God, entered into the pages of history there and was pointed out by him who had been sent ahead to make paths straight so you and I could believe. So how did John know? He said, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So John basically said, I was given a sign. He said, I was told to go out and baptize for the repentance of sin. And when I saw the dove come down and rest on the person that would come forward to be baptized, that I would know that that was the Messiah. And that's exactly what happened. He saw Jesus. But my question is, can we recognize him as the Messiah? Can you see? And I want to make a point, and maybe it'll take some time for you. But what does it take for you and I to be able to see Jesus as the Messiah? Counterintuitively, we need to be able to say that we are blind, that we cannot see. And that's why John, known as John the Baptist, not to be confused with the guy who's writing the book, John, but John the Baptist came baptizing in water. He came baptizing with a baptism that was different from what we experience as believers now. He came with a baptism called the baptism of repentance. The baptism of repentance. Verse 31 says, but so that he might be manifested, that is, being made known to Israel, 
I came baptizing in water. So there was something about this whole process that was going to make known to Israel. And I would like to suggest that it was not just a physical manifestation, but it was a spiritual manifestation. In other words, a manifestation so that people would be able to see them in his heart, in their hearts. Mark 1 4 says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So, why was this baptism for forgiveness of sins part of this process of manifestation? Well, later on in John, we're going to see John, I mean, Jesus talking to some of the Pharisees, and they're sort of upset that he got this blind man to see on the Sabbath. And he asks them a question, and they say, we're not blind, are we? And his answer to them, he says, if you were blind, then you would have no sin. But, I, but since you say we see, your sin remains. One of the things about repentance that is so important for belief is that you and I have to come to this point in our lives where we say, it's not working. What I've been hanging on to does not make sense. I'm blind. I've been running into things all my life not making sense. But if we say, no, I can make it, then we're not ready to let go of the very thing that is dragging us down. I was just talking to somebody later, I mean, earlier this week. And uh, she said, I've made just, just a mess of my life. I've wasted it. I've got regrets. And she was grabbing hold of Jesus as her answer. But she couldn't do that until she'd let go. I think of somebody else years ago that came to the point where she finally said, I was wrong. And in that moment realized where the truth lay. And I go back to my own life and I think of how I just was so blind and could not see. And until I came to that point where I was able to say, I'm blind and I cannot see, that finally the light dawned. We all have to figuratively go through a baptism of repentance before we can grab hold of life. And I want to ask you, have you come to the place where you want to see? If so, then you will see the light. And so the last verse comes John 1, 34. John says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. He, like a man in a court of law, says, I have personally seen this. And I am giving testimony. I am a witness God help me, that this man, Jesus, is the Son of God, the Messiah, the one you and I have been waiting for. He is he. He is the man. Now, there are two groups here listening. There are those who are in process of deciding if Jesus is truly the Messiah. And I hope today has helped you along that path, a path toward understanding that you do have the data to make a decision, and there is a path forward if you're willing to let go of the old way and go forward. There's a lot more to come in this book, and so decide when you're ready. And I hope 
that you will also have that joy. But I want to speak to the second group, and that is the group of people here who have made the decision that, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the Messiah. And I have a couple questions that I want to end with. The first one is, do you have a clear testimony like John's? A testimony that says what it is that you believe and why you believe it. And can you stand in front of people and say, this is what I believe? And that's my second question. Will you tell others? Because with the mouth, we confess Jesus as Lord, as it talks about in Romans chapter 10. If your belief is not of one that has actually been able to come out to your mouth, I want to ask you to really ask yourself, how much do you actually believe it? Go back to the testimony of John. Go back to the testimony of history. Go back to the testimony of the scripture and see what has been laid out before you. Because if everything that we've talked about today is the truth, then you've got a massive amount of information to stand on. And then another question I want to ask is, what does this mean for your daily life? Are you ready to live like the king is coming? The word witness, the word testimony, comes from the Greek word mataria. That is the Greek word that we get the word martyr from. You see, we associate martyrs with people who've died for their faith. But they died because they were giving a testimony of what they believed. And they said, I am willing to hold this testimony even to the point of death. So a martyr is a person who believes and believe so strongly that they're willing to live and die for it. Today, I want you to ask yourself, do I believe what John has testified to, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah? You can't start living until you're not afraid to die. And I can tell you, Jesus has set me free. And I pray that he does the same for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you <clears throat> that you sent John. There's so many things, Lord, that I've learned over the years about things that I never would have even imagined. And one of them is just the importance of a tried and true testimony of a person that can speak to the facts accurately, faithfully, credibly. And we thank you for John, our brother in the Lord, who did so. And I want to pray for all those who are right now, Lord, thinking about this, that you would help them to believe that testimony. And finally, Lord, for those of us who say we believe, Lord, may you give us testimony like John's that we would be able to say unashamedly that the Lord Jesus is Christ forever and ever. Amen. In your precious name, Lord.